Welcome back to the show that tells you. You are a quantum computer with free will collapsing into this three-dimensional physical world from a higher plane of reality. My name is Justin Riddle, and this is episode 31 of the Quantum Consciousness series. In today's episode, I'll be discussing geometric theories of consciousness, the idea that geometry might hold the key to our place in the universe. Some of the theories I'll be discussing are the idea that quantum superpositions are different lower dimensional projections from a single higher dimensional geometric form, and another theory that attempts to provide a geometric description to different psychedelic hallucinations. This episode is available on YouTube, and an audio-only version is available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. If you like what you hear today, then please like this video, subscribe to this channel, leave a comment below, or for the audio listener, write a review. Join me inside the mystery of numbers. Come and hop a metaphysical loop. Zero concepts become objects and then become quadia. Join us for an episode of quantum consciousness. All right, so before we get started, I'll give you a little background on the channel. So this channel was started as an extension of a course that I created while at UC Berkeley. And in making this channel, I'm sort of expanding the content of that material and adapting it for a wider audience and trying to engage in a deeper conversation about, about different theories of quantum consciousness. In my day job, I'm a cognitive neuroscientist and I deliver electric and magnetic brain stimulation in human participants in order to better understand the role of neural oscillations in human cognition and in an attempt to eventually develop novel treatments for various psychiatric illnesses. All right, so today we'll be discussing geometry and the way I'm going to organize this discussion is by using Roger Penrose's three world model. And so in these three world models, we think about the universe as comprised of different elements of, of reality. So one element is understanding the physical world, what's observable and measurable about the world around us. And another aspect or another world is the platonic world as Penrose calls it. And this is the realm of mathematics and geometry fundamentally on some level. This is the world that is shared and universal beyond any one individual. And then the third world that I'll be discussing is the mental world, the world of our experience, of our consciousness. So I'm gonna go from the physical world first, talking about various observations of geometry in biology, in geology, in the world around us. And then on to the platonic world where I will discuss a theory of consciousness that views the universe as being composed of some fundamental theory of everything geometric shape and the physical world and quantum superpositions are sort of projections into this lower dimension. And then finally I'll be talking about the mental world and some work of viewing different psychedelic states and trying to understand the the geometry of, of what these hallucinations kind of entails. So that's the framework for today, and we'll dive right in. Um, what is geometry? What is the evidence that it plays a role in our lives? So I wanna kind of discuss this sort of challenge, right? And the challenge is of Platonism. The idea that a perfect square, a perfect circle, these are fundamentally abstract mathematical constructs. You've never really seen a square in the world around you. You've never really seen a hexagon or a circle. You've seen approximations through human engineering. We've created very close approximations to many of these geometric shapes. But fundamentally, we have this innate sense of what geometry is and there's some arguments, like put forth by Roger Penrose, that we must be tapping into some sort of platonic truth, some sort of meaning or form of this geometry that goes beyond just the physical world. And so I think there's sort of this um, imbalance, this, this tug of war between 
are descriptions of reality which are idealistic. They take the form of, you know, laws of physics, these sort of perfect absolute forces, and then the chaotic world around us where nothing is perfect. Everything is organic and mushy and crunchy. And there doesn't seem to be the exquisite geometry that we can imagine manifesting in the world around us. However, there does appear to be geometric forms manifesting in the world around us to an approximate degree. And I think uh, one very bizarre example is the phenomenon of crystals. And I know this is sort of a hokey new age sort of concept or obsession, but crystals really do exist and they are very weird and interesting. So let's think of the quartz crystal. And the quartz crystal is hexagonal in structure. And if you were digging through a mountain and you're digging deep into the core or, you know, around the crust of the earth, you're going to run into these exquisite hexagonal structures coming out of the earth itself. And this is very bizarre. And why would we see these hexagonal geometries just emerging out of out of the earth out of this raw material of the planet and what we're witnessing is quite bizarre it's it's actually the bond angle of the atoms that compose the crystal that we're able to witness with our naked eyes and so quartz crystals are actually composed of silicone dioxide and so what's really unique about this is that if you get a bunch of water molecules or a bunch of um, silicon dioxide molecules together, they'll actually form bond angles that form a hexagon. And these hexagons are the same hexagons that you see in the quartz crystal and the same hexagons that you see in snowflakes. So snowflakes all have this hexagonal structure and you're essentially seeing a magnification of these atomic bond angles into the macroscopic world. And so what's really bizarre about this is, you know, typically we're not visibly seeing bond angles of different atoms. And, you know, how shocking that we would find this at this macroscopic scale. So what is unique about crystals? What's really wild about them is that the quartz crystal is really a major fundamental progenitor of modern information technology. And so a couple of the properties that uh, have really enabled modern technology is this idea that within a quartz crystal, you have these electric resonance properties that seem to extend across the crystal. Um, and so, for example, there's what's called the piezoelectric effect. And essentially what this means is that if you strike a quartz crystal, it's going to generate an electrical discharge in the vibration of that full crystal. And so this is actually the same mechanism that is in a bunch of lighters. So if you have like a barbecue lighter, there's actually a piston that you're pulling back and it's smacking a quartz crystal. And this is generating a brief burst of electric discharge. And then that is what is lighting um, the flame in that barbecue lighter. So essentially what this is, is there is a transfer from a mechanical vibration into an electrical output. And this is a bi-directional transformation such that in a very reproducible way, you can either mechanically vibrate a quartz crystal to generate electricity or input electricity to generate a mechanical vibration. And so what this has been used for in the past is to enable radio and a lot of um, essentially timekeepers in, uh, in a lot of our technology. So what, what you would do is you would actually find quartz crystals that were tuned to very specific frequency ranges. So you'd have a quartz crystal, which is a certain size, and that is tuned to a certain frequency of vibration. And then it basically is able to transduce vibrations in that frequency range into electricity or vice versa you could pump electricity into the quartz crystal and it would generate these vibrations 
And so in, um, in radio signals, you would have these quartz crystals, which are tuned to different frequency bands, and you could transmit information through radio waves. Essentially, these vibrations traveling through the air are then received by these very sensitive um, quartz crystals that are tuned to these particular frequency bands, and you could both input information and receive information through this sort of electric to mechanical transformation between these crystals. And when you would change the channel, you would essentially switch which quartz crystal you're essentially um, interacting with, and that would then pick up a different frequency range of information in the environment. Um, and furthermore, uh, as you are inputting electricity into these crystals, they have this very, uh, very systematic vibration that they start to resonate in, and you can use this for timekeeping. So a lot of watches and modern um, sort of clocks in computers and in watches are essentially electrifying the small crystals. And because the vibration is so structured and so systematic, it vibrates in this very reproducible way. So all of this is really to say that if you have something in nature which has a very carefully constructed crystalline lattice, it allows you this great degree of controllability over the world around you, right? So instead of having these chaotic forces, if you can find and harness these crystalline geometric objects in the world around us, it gives you a degree of control. And arguably, all of modern technology was enabled by us harnessing the power of various crystalline structures. And so what does this mean for biology? Well, in this modern movement of quantum biology, which I've been talking about a lot in this channel, there seems to be a special role that geometry itself plays in potentially generating more macroscopic quantum phenomenon. So just like this quartz crystal enables you to have real controllable crystalline um, properties that are emerging from a chaotic reality, a lot of the theories of quantum properties in biology come from a similar mechanism. You have these um, like benzene rings, which are hexagons in molecular form, or you have uh, pentagons and hexagons that are being harnessed in molecules. You even have more macroscopic objects like these um, proteins, where at the core of some of these proteins, the theory is that you get these aromatic rings these geometric shapes which have these sort of resonance properties and you can arrange them in the core of your protein and this gives you an ability to sort of transfer electric uh, coherence or electric resonance across more macroscopic scales. And in a very bizarre way, this is very similar to these um, sort of vibrational properties that you find in all sorts of crystalline uh, molecular arrangements. And so a lot of these quantum biology propositions are trying to create what's called decoherence-free zones. And these are places or spaces in biology where you can keep the decoherent chaotic forces of the environment at bay and you can maintain these more subtle quantum properties within these sort of safe spaces. And so this is sort of the, the big challenge in, in biology right now. How have biological systems been able to possibly create and sustain more and more macroscopic um, quantum coherent forces? And it seems like it comes from geometry in some mysterious, maybe yet to be understood way. You don't want to go full crystalline structure because then you can't change. There's, you know, you're kind of locked in. And so it seems like perhaps biology 
has been working towards finding this critical balance where you want to have these like geometric, crystalline, stable mega structures, but you want to allow for change. You want to allow for dynamics. And could it be that quantum biology is somehow finding this balance point, this critical point between non-geometric, chaotic, disorganized forces and then these more organized geometric crystalline forces. And so if you're um, watching the series, you'll see that there's multiple points where there's sort of this reference to geometry in some abstract way in the physical world as a mechanism for enabling quantum biology. Um, and I think this is still an ongoing debate, an ongoing source of mystery, but I really want to encourage you out there to really ponder, you know, why is it that crystals, as hokey pokey as that seems to us, you know, they really did enable a massive upgrade in human technology um, going into these finer scales of, of controllability with lasers down at the atomic level. Um, and so to what degree has modern technology harnessed these geometric crystalline properties? And is there sort of a mirror of that going on in biological systems, you know, harnessing this geometry to create more mega structures, macroscopic structures that, um, yeah, that could potentially be used for quantum computation or other forms of, um, of organization. All right, on to the platonic world. So that was sort of so like, you know, talking about different theories of using geometry in the physical domain. Another major point here in, in geometry and theories of consciousness is people trying to create a theory of everything through these different geometric descriptions. And I love this sort of endeavor. Um, and one point of contention, or I think one sort of like point of debate here is to what degree are physicists actually Platonists? And so you'll often, you know, if you're going around spouting ideas about quantum consciousness, you'll often run into people who are staunch physicalists and they'll say, you know, ah, like I believe in only the physical world and everything must be physical and there's no such thing as, as human consciousness or free will or human existence. And so I would question them, what do you mean by physical? And they say, oh, the laws of physics, right? There's these governing forces. Well, these governing forces appear to be mathematical in nature. You know, that's not really physical in the strict sense that you have some chaotic, you know, system, right? So I think on one camp, you have these like cellular automata theories, like there's just a bunch of chaotic forces and then these emergent patterns that are occurring out of the chaos. And then on the other side, you have people working with creating new laws of physics, new ways of describing mathematics, new forms of geometry, which will unify everything and be like the theory of all things. And this is very much on the side of Platonism. And maybe this is a false dichotomy, but maybe it's a false equivalence to say that these two are identical. You know, the physical world itself versus the laws, the mathematics governing this. Um, and Penrose would say that these are distinct. You know, you have space time, physical reality, the here, the there, and then you have the forces, the mathematics, these, um, these sort of forms in the platonic realm. So what are people working on? Well, I just want to highlight one theory, which is highly relevant to quantum consciousness, but I think there's a lot of theories um, if you're if you're out there thinking about this, I'm sure you can think of a couple different theories out there that kind of rely heavily on these um, geometries. But the theory I want to highlight, um, just because I find it interesting, and I and I met the the author of this theory um, back in the day at one of the the Tucson consciousness conferences. Uh, this uh, researcher Clee Irwin, and he calls this a quasi crystalline language. Um, and so essentially, how he frames this is that. 
he's trying to answer the hard problem of consciousness, you know, what are feelings, what is human experience, how do you explain all the ooey-gooey emotions that we have, and he's making an attempt to say that if only we could uncover the geometric form that describes all forces in the universe, he claims that there's something called the E8 lattice, some sort of eight-dimensional geometric lattice structure, and he frames that a superposition is different quasi-crystalline projections from this higher dimensional form. So just to you know, sort of explain what a projection is. So if I took a cube, and this is just a three-dimensional cube, and I project it into 2D space, there's a bunch of different shapes that you could find. So I'll display a couple different um, pictures of what this might look like uh, for you watching on YouTube. But you can imagine it's a square. You can imagine if you're looking at it from an angle, it looks kind of like a trapezoid. You know, there's all these different shapes that you could have projected on the 2D level, the 2D plane, and yet there's a single three-dimensional object. And so essentially what he's pitching is that if we could uncover, and perhaps him and his team have uncovered, uh, this eight-dimensional structure, this geometric form, all the laws of physics, and you know, this is this grand theory of everything, and as you have a single system going into a superposition, you're essentially going into different projections into this lower dimensional plane. And so you superpose into different possible realities. This is sort of like the splitting into different space-time geometries in, um, in like the hammerhoff penrose model. So you split off into two simultaneous space-time geometries in superposition. And then you collapse the wave function into one or the other. And essentially what he is pitching is that as you go into these different superpositions, they're actually just two projections, two different options of how to reduce this multidimensional geometric form into 3D space-time. So you have this space-time reality, that space-time reality. They're mutually exclusive, but they're mutually exclusive and they're they're within the same higher dimensional geometric form, right? And so some of the selling points of this, I think one thing that he's he's pitching here is that this is a language in the sense that now every superposition is sort of a different reduction of the same form. And so if you claim that all of us share the same platonic realm, we all share the same universal meaning, the same set of universal mathematics. I understand a square, you understand a square, we all understand a square, because it's the same square. I am projected into this three-dimensional form right now, and you're projected into your three-dimensional form over yonder, and yet you can back project us up into the same multi-dimensional space. So we're both kind of like different expressions of the same geometry, you know? We are the same geometric form, you and I, and yet here I am being projected this way, and you're over there being projected a different way. And so that that's kind of the appeal of this model, is that, hey, there is now a shared space, a shared language. There's a vocabulary that we can both have access to because we're both navigating and exploring the same geometric form as each other. And so I put this within sort of the platonic domain of explanations because it's really an attempt to kind of find a structure for the platonic domain for the shared reality that we have. And so when I experience love and you experience love, we get each other because it's the same love projection from this form. Maybe it's so complicated or it's such a complex space that we're getting like different sub projections within a love-like space of this uh, geometry. 
And yet there's enough of like a shared reality here that we can kind of get each other, you know? So I think, I think that's sort of a nice appeal of theories like this. And in a way, the Penrose model is implicitly getting at something like this, right? So in the Penrose hammer off model, uh, they kind of hand wave or Penrose kind of hand waves and says, there's some non-computational force at the Planck scale of space-time geometry and your mind is sort of collapsing down into fundamental space-time and all these platonic values, this like mathematical perfection is held in geometry at the level of space-time. So just like in that theory, there's sort of this romanti romanticization of geometry and sort of a a, a understood acceptance that geometry gives us a common language because it's universal. There's something shared universal intuitively about geometry because you get a square, I get a square. Um, and I think the challenge here, and this is a, my own criticism on kind of both of these theories, is yeah, we can invoke geometry and say it's universal. And yeah, there's something universal about geometry. However, does this answer the hard problem of consciousness? You know, could you make love out of shapes? And I kind of say it facetiously, but then also not even, you know, the pitch is that you could assemble love from geometry, but what does that even mean? You know, the color green, the fury of anger, the, the smell of a rose, how could these be geometric forms? Does geometry just generate, you know, qualia or the feelings, uh, the senses that we have. Um, and I, I still think that's a big jump, you know? I don't think we can do that per se with like, you know, these more chaotic neurobiological models. And I don't know if geometry can just suddenly be an answer to that. You know, maybe geometry is like the antithesis of the chaotic attractor that generates random meaning versus geometry is like perfect shared universal meeting you know the one true shape that unites us all um, how does that even then answer these questions fundamentally i still don't see how that really um, solves the problem of qualia so we'll leave it at that all right on to the third topic of today and this is is there a geometry of qualia of our experience right that missing bit that missing part that i i don't really see how you could make love out of a series of shapes um can we learn anything about qualia through geometry and is there something geometric to our experience so here i'm looking to some really amazing interesting work by andres gomez emilson and he is uh, part of the Qualia Research Institute. I think he's the founder. And he has these really great lectures. I recommend that you go check them out where he's discussing this concept of hyperbolic geometry and thinking about the shape of our experience. So in this, uh, this lecture and in, in this paper, this write-up that he has on this, um, he attempts to map out different stages of the DMT psychedelic experience. And what he's doing is he's trying to say what is sort of the phenomenology, the reported experience of people entering into these different stages of this psychedelic trip. And is there any sort of shared quality here? And I won't go into all the stages of, of this experience, um, and I recommend you check out his work, but to kind of jump to what I think is the coolest bit of all of this is that there's this idea that in these very high intensity psychedelic experiences, people regularly have this sort of common bizarre geometric experience, right? These sort of like fractaling outward um, shapes, similar to like Alex Gray art. Um, I'll include a couple examples here, but if um, go, go look up Alex Gray. Um, there's sort of these certain artists which have captured 
common hallucinatory experiences fairly well in their art, in their representations. But Andres pushes us, is this just art or is there sort of a geometric description of what is going on here? And so he engages with what is called hyperbolic geometry. And this is as opposed to Euclidean geometry, where Euclidean geometry is sort of naive, intuitive, three-dimensional world. You have parallel lines. They don't intersect. You have squares that are at a right angle. You can tile a plane with squares. You just fit them next to each other. And in hyperbolic geometry, it's as if space itself or the, ge the geometric plane is sort of like folding outward constantly. And so you can have these bizarre um, tiling patterns where you could take a bunch of squares and have the squares touch. You could have five squares meet and yet they all still have right angles with each other. But because the space is sort of folding outwards, you're able to tile that space. So go look up hyperbolic geometry uh, visualizations. It really helps you sort of think about this. But Andres basically says that when you're in the psychedelic state, it appears that people are able to visualize hyperbolic geometric forms. And maybe you don't need to be in the psychedelic state to access these experiences, but people report, I saw these impossible shapes that couldn't possibly be real. And there's this idea that it's impossible. It could never happen. But Andres is basically pushing us to think, you know, is it impossible or is it just a different form of geometry than what we're used to? And these shapes are real. They are describable. And maybe in the psychedelic state, we naturally and intuitively are able to visualize these geometric forms that are beyond just Euclidean geometry. So I think there's two really interesting um, implications here. One, Roger Penrose suggests that our ability to ascertain mathematical truth comes from some form of visualization, some form of intuitive geometric understanding. And so if Andres is correct, if your mind can actually genuinely visualize hyperbolic geometry and shapes within these hyperbolic spaces, then this could, I don't know, open the door to new types of mathematical understanding that people are tapping into, maybe give us a better grasp on how people are reaching mathematical truth through the power of visualization in a way that we might not get just from Euclidean uh, geometry or visualization in Euclidean geometry. And I think another implication is what is the substrate of this? You know, or maybe it's a question, you know, what is the substrate of us having hyperbolic geometric visualization capacity in these altered states of consciousness? And so I want to, you know, kind of throw back to quantum computers here. If we view the mind as a quantum computer, the quantum bit can be conceptualized as a sphere. This is called the block sphere. And the state of your quantum bit is a vector or a point that's moving around in this sphere. And that point represents the probabilities of being in this state or of that state, right? And so you can represent the probability of moving around in this space. And a quantum computer is essentially taking many of these block spheres, many of these quantum bits, and you entangle them together such that there's a single wave function, which you can imagine once again is like a single point or a vector moving around now, not just in one of these spheres, but in a multi-dimensional space encompassing all of the quantum bits which are inside of your quantum computer. So now the wave function is this movement through this multi-dimensional block sphere space. Right, and this is called the Hilbert space. So the quantum computer is this Hilbert space and the wave function is moving around. Now, couple leaps of faith here, but if we 
take uh, the proposition that your mind is a quantum computer, you are a quantum computer, then your mind is some sort of movement through this multidimensional quantum bit space. There's all these block spheres, there's this Hilbert space, which represents your mind, and it's evolving and transforming and moving. Could it be that in our everyday typical experience, we have a Euclidean space, a sort of like standard geometry space of your mind. Your Hilbert space is Euclidean geometry, very adapted, amenable to navigating a three-dimensional world because we're, we're interacting with the world around us. It's useful for our quantum computing mind to sort of faithfully represent this Euclidean world around us. But what if these Hilbert spaces are able to take on other forms of geometry and not just like simulating geometry within it, but what if psychedelics are somehow altering the fundamental form of that space itself so that if your mind is a quantum computer and it's this multidimensional Hilbert space, what if psychedelics or these altered states of consciousness that maybe you could reach in other ways is actually representing some sort of shift in the geometric substrate of that system itself. And now it's altered, and now the objects that enter into that space can now be visualized as, as they are, as these hyperbolic geometric objects. And this would be a very bizarre world indeed, um, but maybe we've just been trained through our experience in the three-dimensional world to kind of simulate things three-dimensionally. And maybe, you know, in these altered states, you just break out of that. So it could be a change in what is being processed, or it could be a change in the space itself. So this would be potentially, um, and I think Andres would suggest, that this is like the space of qualia, the space of your experience, and it is not necessarily Euclidean, or it is not necessarily locked into the perception of Euclidean geometry, and there is maybe other expanded forms of, of thought that could be um, that could be taking place in in these altered um, spaces. So. Anyways, all of that to say, geometry is really cool and there's a lot of interesting stuff to think about. To summarize the topics I've talked about today, it was a bit disjointed, a bunch of different theories. There's geometry in the physical world around us, in molecules, in crystals, some clue that through modern technology we've been able to harness the crystalline forces or through harnessing crystalline geometric shapes we can maybe expand our technology or biology can expand its capabilities. We've talked about the platonic world, theories of everything that are geometrical in origin. And then we ended talking about what is the geometric space of our minds and of our experiences and could it be more than just Euclidean geometry. So I'll leave you with that, a lot to think about and I love to hear what you think about all this. Talk to you again real soon.